Hello everybody, I'm Will Crosby and this is my show now. No more stupid Ian. That's right, I may look and sound different, but I'm the same old person. And this is my show now. Uh, sorry folks, I was on vacation last week. I know we missed an episode, but that's okay. That means we've got two weeks of goodness to go through with Kyle Bailey. How's it going, buddy? It's going good. I'm glad you're back. I'm glad you're you're Will now. I mean, I think you're a vast improvement on the on the original, so. Yeah, I just didn't change anything about myself. I just changed my name and it just makes yeah. me better. Yeah, it just works. You know? It works. It works. Uh, so, you know, before we dive into my big European vacation, uh, let's talk about the games you've been playing. I see uh, one game, four words and a mid-placed colon in here. You've been playing Fire Emblem Three Houses. Is that right? Yeah, it's... um. Uh, so as you know, I'm a big Fire Emblem fan. I grew up playing it on my Game Boy, uh, through the the GameCube, the Wii. Um, the Wii version of Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn was the last Fire Emblem game I ever played. Uh, I never played uh, any of the ones with like Chrome or Chrome or however you pronounce his name. Um, and Three Houses was available for the Switch. It was like discounted. It was like 40 bucks. It's normally 60 because it's a Nintendo game and Nintendo games yep. are never put on sale. Yep. Um, so I picked it up and I played about an hour yesterday and I'm worried. <laughs> um, I, I'm very worried because I had... In the span of one hour, which is normally, you know, the tutorial, the game gets you situated, gets you used to the the various things you're going to be doing in the rest of the game. Yeah. In one hour, I had one, like, four-minute battle. And the rest of the game has been me physically running around yeah. my character in a school. And I was not prepared for that. Not prepared for the lack of battles, at least at the beginning. Again, I, I'm only one hour in, so maybe there's a ton more as the game goes on. Mm -hmm. But man, I don't know if I like it. I, I certainly don't know if I like it. Yeah, I, um, you know, it's interesting hearing you say that because how do I put this? I don't think it's a good game. And everybody, oh everybody loves Fire Emblem Three Houses, but I played maybe two hours of it and i dropped mm. it and it's because that it's it's not a it's not a good it's not a good fire emblem game i'm just gonna say it like if you uh. you go to fire emblem for the tactics and like a little bit of the story but mostly just the solid tactics right i'm not saying three houses doesn't have solid tactics but it's got way too much fucking virtual novel run around chores bullshit in it and it's not even a good version of that game, you know? It's not like it's not like Stardew Valley. It's not like Factorio. It's not like Cult of the Lamb, you know, other games that have like a central area with chores and stuff like that. Yeah. It it's not good. It's I I know that's a very divisive opinion and in many ways it's a personal opinion, but it, they added too much bullshit to it. And I, I'm just so happy to hear you say that as well. And that's kind of what I'm hearing from you because so many people think it's the best Fire Emblem and they're wrong. So I, I come to Fire Emblem for the tactics and a little bit for the story. I actually really like the story of Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn because they're two games on two separate consoles that are actually the same one, one big story, which is awesome. Um, you know, the story growing up, like playing the playing the original Fire Emblem, uh, or at least the one that was released in North America, um, those always had really cute kind of not cute, but like very, very traditionally fantasy stories. Um, and, you you know, you get close to the characters you play yeah. with because you like their animations when they're battling. You like the fact that some characters, you know, like they start out like really, really crappy and you can you can work your way up. But something about Three Houses just feels like they they intentionally we're trying something different which kudos to them like you know always always a fan of trying to shake things up but i'm scared <laughs> like i think i think i might get to where you ended your your two-hour playthrough and i might 
like try and go a little bit past that and then and then maybe not that's actually the exact same thing that happened when i started playing sable is you said mm. you got like two hours into it and you were like i'm done and i got about two two and a half hours into it and i was like no i'm not playing this anymore this is yeah. stupid yeah um but sable's a good yeah. game three houses is not uh yeah i to get i think i did so the way it's structured is it's like you can do a battle and then you go back and you do some chores bullshit and then you then you could do a battle i think i did I think I went back and did chores bullshit like three times. <laughs> yeah. So I was not that far into the game, which was a shame because I felt like they were establishing some good story and some good characters, but making mm -hmm. me run around like a pretty like dull, what feels like a giant open world space, just constantly mm -hmm. having to be like, Oh, I got to go talk to this person. Now let me go talk. To What's this other mechanic? There's like a school pot and all this stuff like like persona. I played persona five. Persona five has a similarity to that in terms of like there are chores and you have like time blocks to do things. But it yeah. is so fucking stylish and simple in the way that it's presented that it's 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 lovely. It's so much fun doing that. Like you start doing these things just because you're like, I want to go back to that really cool area. I want to see that cool animation transition again. And yeah. so you just, you love doing it. And you're like, I love this character. I want to go spend some time with them. But Three Houses is just like, I know this is your game segment, but I'm, I, I, I didn't know this would happen. But you, like, I, I wanted to love Three Houses so much. I loved, yeah. uh, Awakening was my first one. That was the, mm. I think that was the first the 3DS. 3DS one. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. I loved it. Um, I almost beat it. I got to the final battle and I realized I would have to grind a bit to beat it. Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just put it down then. Because at that point, I, I played like <laughs> you basically beat the game. Yeah. Yeah. I played like 30 hours in a week. Um, and oh, then wow. okay. Birthright and Conquest, I think I got Birthright mm. and I got it. I, it was it was a double whammy. It was my birthday and I was also on a business trip which means I was sitting in a hotel room doing nothing. And I yeah. played 25 hours of that game in like three days. Wow. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't beat it, but I loved it. And I was like, mm. this is fantastic. And so I was ready for three houses and it was getting great reviews. And it's not a fucking Fire Emblem game. You know, I'm, I don't mean to yeah. shit on the game you just started. You should absolutely give it some more time because people love it. But that game was not for me. So it's actually, it's funny that you talk about some of those other games because playing Three Houses, even just for the hour that I have, reminded me a lot of, um, I have my my Wii set up mm -hmm. uh, that I, I finally got. I have my N64 and my Wii and my Switch. So it's sort of like my media center is like a Nintendo love child. Um, and I was looking through the Wii's menu just to see like, there's a ton of old stuff. I have like really old pictures that I put on like the original SD card that came, that I got with the Wii. It's, it's crazy. And I'm scrolling through and there's a game on there that I downloaded at some point from the Wii store. And it's called My Life as a King. And it's a Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles uh, mm -hmm. sort of WiiWare kind of game. It was Square Enix game. So they, they developed it. Um, but it came out in like 2008. I'm just looking it up now. And it's weirdly, I'm getting like vivid, like memory flashes of playing this game when I was when I was thinking about Three Houses. And it's kind of like the same thing. You're you're the king of a town, but you're really young. So you have to go around, you have to talk to everybody. And there's certain chores you can do. You can like send people out to scout. They come back and, and the entire game takes place in this town. And I I never knew what to do in that game. Like, I, yeah. I didn't know what the point of the game was. It was a city building game. I knew you could upgrade the buildings and you could, you know, level up your experience with uh, relationships with people. And Three Houses so far feels kind of like that slapped on top of a, a tactical game. And I, I'm going to keep playing, but I don't necessarily think I'm going to like it. So I... Yeah. I just just from the outset i think you and i might be might be thinking the exact same thing but i'll i'll give it more time i'll yeah. do at least one more week of playing and we'll we'll see where where i end up i i will say i it feels like you're in the mind space for fire emblem or at least mm. a game similar to this and so i would say if you do bounce off of it my recommendation is make a decision in your mind if you want more tactics fire emblem or if you want more of the run around like meeting people and doing things but really well done 
And I feel mm. like if you want more Fire Emblem, go out and get a 3DS or 2DS or whatever and get Fire Emblem Awakening or even Birthright or Conquest because those are fantastic. And that's just, it's like, um, I believe it was Birthright and Conquest. They added like a city builder part where you're like building up a little castle area and you do have yeah. like a, a small amount of chores, but it's just like, it's all in an overworld map. It's it's not, it's nowhere near as bad as Three Houses. It's just does. like a little ancillary thing you can do. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so it's really nice because it's like, it's like, hey, we've added this as a mechanic and you are going to interact with it, but it's not annoying at all. And it actually adds to the game. And then, and then okay. just solid Fire Emblem between Awakening, Birthright and Conquest. You've got like, just like, I don't know, like 60, 70 plus just fantastic battles. Um, I, I've always wanted to play Awakening. I just, I need a 3DS. Can you, can you emulate that? Could I play that on you could, Dolphin or something? But, but honestly, um, the 3DS and the, the whole 3DS gen, no matter which one you pick, mm -hmm. it's a fantastic time for that console because you can still find ones in really good condition. You can still buy plenty of accessories for them in good condition or brand yeah. new. Oh, okay. And it's also very easy to acquire games. Yeah. For those consoles, including non 3DS games. It is incredibly easy. And once you do, you basically have. Uh, I, I, I have mine sitting here. I would have shown it to you. You have a little device you can take with you that becomes like better than the Switch as a travel because it's it flips, it closes itself. You don't even need a case for yeah. it. And it's just an incredible thing. So honestly, I would just. I would buy a 2DS, a new 2DS XL. That's the way to go. Because it's the straight okay. form factor, but you don't have any 3DS bullshit. Um, the other half, though. Nothing against Fire Emblem. But if you're like, hey, what if somebody did this game but better? Three houses better. You should play Persona 5 Royal. Or just Persona okay. 5, whatever edition. Because I... that, that has chores in it, but the way that it presents it, it does not feel tedious at all. It's fantastic. It's very I've good. never I've never played a Persona game. So I, I'm going to go in right now and I'm going to add it to my wish list just so that I remember. Yeah. I, I'd never played one either. And I played Persona 5. I played about 60 hours of it, which was like. Is it halfway. Strikers? Persona 5? No, no, you don't want that. That's the Musou game. Okay. The Musou game. Okay. Um, it's, it's a JRPG. So it's not it's not the same style of combat as Fire Emblem, but mm -hmm. it does what Three Houses wants to do, which is. Have you like going around and being like, should I work my job? Should I go study? Should I go spend time with this character or that character? Mm. And it's fantastic. Um, yeah, just to shit on three houses a little bit more. Like, <laughs> I didn't even like the combat in three houses. Granted, I played three battles, but uh, did you like the? I didn't like the look or the feel of it. it the battle it feels really. It feels really sluggish. Yeah, like I'm. I'm so used to. And, and granted, I have literally years and years of experience playing fire emblem where it's like you hold down b and like you're uh whenever you're moving the the selector it like shoots over yeah. like if you just if you just tap it it goes slower but if you hold down b and like that didn't feel crisp it, i think that's what it, it didn't feel crisp it felt really sluggish and kind of yeah. slow and i i was just thinking i was playing on my my switch controller my uh, switch pro controller and i was like maybe it's maybe it's the controller like maybe i should just use the 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 handheld stuff and I, I i didn't have time to test it but i have a feeling just from what you're saying it's not really going to make much of a difference so i don't know like i i just don't i'm i'm struggling to find what people love about it so much i i think it's that people love the story and the chores so much honestly i think it's that people it felt like people were like hey it's fire emblem it's great fire emblem combat plus you get to like like give gifts to people and do tea room and tea time with them and it's like yeah sure that sounds cool except like you said like it's sluggish and running around it, it's just like fire emblem three houses people loved it so much and yeah. then it everything pretty much everything about it just put me off about it so i i would definitely say give it a couple more hours but if you're if you're if you're hating it like i was hating it in those first couple hours I don't think it gets any better necessarily. Like there's probably a little bit more to do and the story gets better, quote unquote, or more mm -hmm. interesting, but those core mechanics are bad. They're going to be there the rest of the game. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give it some more time and then I'll report back next time I'm on local chat and we'll, we'll discuss. Yeah. But I want to hear about your games you played, which are not games at all, unless they were physical. What happened in Europe? What is Europe? <laughs> 
Well, uh, you've been to Europe, right? Because you, you did at least one trip to Russia. I don't know if you've been to Europe otherwise. Yeah, I yeah I, I went to Moscow and Sochi, and I, I have stepped foot in Germany via the airport in Frankfurt. But other than okay. that, that's it. So I, I have been to Europe four times now. Actual Europe trips, not, not layovers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so one time was to the UK, another time was to France, and then southern Germany and Austria. And this trip in particular that I just came back from was, we flew into Paris, uh, and so we did north, northeast France, and then we did Belgium, and then we did the Netherlands, and then we did northwest Germany. Um, oh, awesome. And then we came back to Paris. So this was my father and I. Basically, the, the, the premise of the trip was basically twofold. One is my father in his retirement has gotten very invested in uh, World War II history, but in particular in the Battle of the Bulge, um, because his father was in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, which oh. is my grandfather. So he was mm -hmm. he was a machine gunner on an M10 tank destroyer, part of the 634th Tank Destroyer Battalion. Um, and basically, my dad's been doing a lot of research. And at some point, he ended up... My father fought in the Hurtgen Forest, which is in northwest Germany. And uh, at some point, my father found out that there is, like, a local conference there of, like, historians and history buffs called, like, the Hurtgen Forest conference or whatever so he started mm -hmm. going every year to this conference that him and my mom would go and now he has all these friends in germany and i i think like the funniest one honestly is the person who runs the conference is the uh -huh. is the mayor of the small german town that my f grandfather fought in <laughs> so that's crazy but that's also really cool yeah I mean, like so, so like so he basically like he my my dad knows a lot of these sites but he also knows all these historians and uh over there and and kind of the premise of this group is basically they bring uh relatives of world war ii veterans both german and american and british as well as uh sometimes the veterans themselves which is getting harder nowadays and has them revisit the battlegrounds that their relatives or themselves were at um sure. and so he has so so talking to the uh the, the one of the german historians he was talking about how <laughs> He was talking about how the veterans would show up and like they would go out in the in the forest and the veteran would be like, oh, yeah, I remember this. And he would like lead them through the forest and they would find his old foxhole, which is just a hole oh in the gosh. ground that is still there. And <laughs> he had a really good he had a really funny story. He told us this time, which was when it first started in like the 90s, um, there were a bunch of German veterans that showed up and uh, one of them that showed up was a lieutenant. And the other one of the other veterans was like, hey, wait a minute. Aren't you that asshole lieutenant that almost got us <laughs> killed? And the lieutenant was like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the next day he didn't show up and he's never been heard oh from again. Gosh. <laughs> like wow. he just got Sounds like some different <laughs> lieutenant. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So so he has all these funny stories, but he was telling us stories like. Um, uh, so where he in the town that he lives and where he lives, there's a there's a castle nearby, maybe a couple hundred meters from his family house. And he was talking about how during during World War Two, his father, who was like eight or nine at the time, something around there, went to the castle basement to hide. And uh, when he went to the castle basement, he there were a bunch of Germans there. There were a couple Germans there already. And there was a column of German tanks going down the road. And these three American planes showed up, and they started strafing the tanks. And so <laughs> one of the uh, one of the German sergeants or NCOs was like was <laughs> like grabbed an MG42, grabbed a private, put the MG42 on the private's shoulder so that he could aim it in the air. And he aimed at one of the planes, and he fired a burst, and he hit the plane, and the plane what? crashed. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then so then the other planes turn around and they started attacking the castle, and they're like, "Oh shit, get in the basement, get in the basement!" And oh so, so part of this guy's work is that he like he wrote a book about this, and he's been collecting the stories, but he also reaches out to the veterans and put these pieces together. So he reached out mm -hmm. to the relatives of the people who were in the plane that got shot down, and is like, "Hey, I, I, you know, so and so, so and so, I heard the other side," and he like puts people in contact with each other. Um. That's awesome. Yeah. So long story short, my dad's been doing that for a couple of years and it always sounded kind of interesting, but also, you know, I didn't want to necessarily spend a vacation with my mother and father doing just that. 
nothing actually yeah. yeah absolutely nothing against the content it's just i don't want to spend that much time in europe with my parents that sounds boring <laughs> Um, but what changed, however, is that I got into Formula One and at one point somehow I mentioned that there was a Belgian Grand Prix and they were like, where is it? And I was like, oh, it's in Spa, Spa Franker shop. And they're like, that's like 20 minutes from where our conference is every year. And they're like, we drive what? by that every year. So basically what ended up happening over the last couple of years is my dad and I realized we could have a super trip where we would go to the Belgian Grand Prix, the Formula One Grand Prix in Belgium. And then all around the weekend of the Grand Prix, him and I can go visit all these sites that he's seen and some of them that he hasn't seen. Mm. Um, so that's pretty much what we did. We just went to a bunch of like World War One, World War Two battlefields and cemeteries and stuff. And then we went to the Belgian Grand Prix, which was a lot of fun. Um, it's at this historic racetrack that's been around for like 100 years called Spa Francorchamp. So it's it's really cool because... Motor races suck in person, like unless mm. it's like NASCAR or a short track, like you just like see a section of the road and then the cars go past and then you have to like look at a big screen TV or look at your phone to even like know what's going on because the announcers won't be saying much either because typically it's too fucking loud for the announcers to, to say anything. So it's just like you can't watch it. You're just there, yeah. but you can't really watch it and follow it. But to be able to go to this racetrack that I know very well, that is historic, has all this like 100 years of history behind it. It's one of the racetracks that I did a 24 hour endurance race for. So like I knew every single corner, but to be mm -hmm. able to like sit there and be like, oh shit, oh Rouge and Redion is like much steeper than I actually thought it was in person and like walk all yeah. around it was fantastic. Um, yeah, I've actually, um, I, so I used to watch Top Gear a lot when it was on, not the, not the US version, the UK version. And yeah. Um, Jeremy Clarkson tested I think it was the McLaren P1 at Spa yeah um, and it was it was like really wet it was in the rain and he just the way he talked about it and I think he mentioned a little bit about the history um, it seemed like such a really cool place to go and see so I can't even imagine being there let alone like seeing a race there obviously it's a completely different experience but that's that's awesome. yeah yeah so that that, that was part of it was like Going to a Formula One race is always kind of fun because as an American, there's not a lot of F1 fans. There's a lot more now than there were when I started watching. But um, just being surrounded by a bunch of people and everybody's like there for the sport that you're excited about that you normally can't talk to anybody about because it's very niche where you're from was yeah. cool. And then also just seeing the track and being like, this is historic. You know, <laughs> it's like it's like going to like uh, Fenway Park. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but it's funny you mentioned Top Gear. Because do you remember they probably did it a couple times, but the Top Gear episodes where they go to the Nurburgring or Nordschleife. Yeah. So that, that James was, May hates. <laughs> yes. So that was two hours away. Oh. So when I realized that, I I told my dad, I was like, listen, we're going to that track. It's two hours away. We went to the track and I basically the the crazy thing about Nurburgring and the Nordschleife, which if you're not familiar with it's basically a 22 kilometer which i think is like 14 miles or something like that it's mm -hmm. this very long track it's through the woods it's been there since like the 20s or the 30s it's very dangerous because of the changes in elevations and everything and because it's huge so if somebody crashes there they're out there they're out there yeah. yeah but the other crazy thing about it is that they have public sessions so pretty much every day for at least a couple hours they open the track to the public and you can drive it as much as you want at speed you just have to pay like a like a lap price or something which i think the last time i checked was like 10 bucks a lap or something like it's it's dirt cheap not that bad yeah so i when we realized that i i had some options uh, we didn't want i let me get i didn't want to take the rental car out there because I already knew from some research that if I crash the rental car, like the rental car place won't cover it and my credit card won't cover stuff. it. Yeah, yeah, they'll just be like, no, no, you were racing the car. No, it, it, fuck no, it's all on you, buddy. <laughs> so the other thing is there's a bunch of rental places next to the track that lets you rent a car with insurance to do it. And I was thinking okay. about that. And then I was like, no, that's a good way to die, you fucking idiot, because it's like 130 turns. There's people all around you who aren't necessarily trained going very fast. 
and and like you go on YouTube and you type in like Nurburgring and you're just going to find endless compilation videos of crashes of some idiot taking a turn wrong and crashing yeah. and totaling their car. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that, which led me to the third option, which is I basically paid somebody 300 bucks to take me and my dad around the Nordschleife in an electric Audi, like 700 horsepower. And we did an eight minute lap and it fucking ripped y'all. That's like, amazing. Like I was like, okay, 300 bucks. It sounds like a lot, but I was like, you know what? This is going to be the best way to experience it because it's somebody who knows it. And I was like, I don't know. Like, is it really going to be worth it? Is it just like a, like a literally like an eight minute car ride? And I was just like, I don't know. So we get in the car and I'm like talking to the guy and he's like, he's like, you know, being nice. And we get through the gate and he goes, and he goes, you know, this car's really heavy. So we're not going to be super fast through the turns but you know what's great about it and i said what and he goes well it has instant it's electric so i can do this and he slams it and we go like zero to 60 in like three seconds like literally three <laughs> seconds and then we just keep going and i was just like oh he's not going slow and he <laughs> he just rips through the course like literally the tires are squealing the whole time that course is crazy because there's so much elevation changed um there was like a recording of us in the car, but it actually wasn't great quality. But one of the things that really did well was it had a G-force tracker on it. So we're yeah. literally pulling like two G's through some of the corners and like, it was just like, <laughs> just fucking insane. And it's, it's by far the most dangerous thing I've ever done because even though he's a qualified driver and everything, like we're going like 120 miles per hour through these blind corners. And like, all it mm. takes is like, a tire to go or something or the brakes to go and we're fucked we're in the wall and then there's people there's there's people in fucking like volkswagen jettas like yeah. or like porsches around us and they're slower and they're getting in the way and like the guy knew how to handle it like he's flashing the lights and they were good about getting out of the way but all it takes is like some fucking idiot pulling out at the wrong not, time not understand the rules yeah <laughs> yeah and and we would have just fucking slammed into him in like 120 miles per hour so it was a fantastic experience, but like, it's, it's one of those things where like, like my dad and I, we couldn't stop talking about it afterwards. Cause he's not even big into race cars either, but like you watch that's a car an experience. That's like being yeah. in the car. That's yeah. different. Yeah. And that, and that's the crazy thing is that like you watch a race car and you're like, wow, they're going fast. And you're like, oh yeah, mm. look at that. Look at, you have no idea. But once you're in the car and you're experiencing like how fast that feels and how like chaotic it is and how much fucking like lateral force is going you're just like holy shit like <laughs> like when we left my dad thought about it for a couple minutes and he goes he goes you know when i was in the military i had this opportunity one time where i got to do a backseat ride in an f-18 and we were like doing barrel rolls over the desert and like dropping a thousand pound bombs and stuff and he was like that did not scare me as much as that fucking lap around the nerve ring. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, yeah, that was pretty fucking scary. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, you, you think about it, you're, you're up in an F-18 with a trained, you know, fighter pilot. Yeah. You don't have other people in like Cessnas blocking your way, you know? Exactly. So yeah. That's, and that's something, crazy. something goes wrong unless like literally your plane blows up, you can glide or at least eject. What is yeah. this car? Like <laughs> you're, you're pretty yeah. much screwed. Yeah. But so, that's awesome. And for $300, that sounds very reasonable to have like a semi-professional driver take you around. I exactly. would definitely do that. Yeah. And so it's, it was, it was like two once in a lifetime, like motor racing opportunities, like literally on a Sunday and then a Monday right after. And it was, it was amazing. Um, so yeah, it's just, just one other point on the Europe trip is that like, um, the World War One and World War Two visits we got to do. So we went to like Verdun and Bella Wood and um, Aachen and Hurtgen Forest and some other places as well. Um, it's it's weird. <laughs> like, like, OK, this is going to sound I don't it's OK. How do I put this? It's like this weird mentality where like when you grow up, you're like, America's great. We're the greatest country in the world. Right. And then you're like, eh, not really. And then you go to Europe and I hate to be one of those people, but it's increasingly true, which is just Europe is just better. Like just pretty much everything they have made the correct decision on and they have the correct yeah. culture on and America does not. But then you're walking through like Bastogne uh, or the Netherlands and there's all these like really just like the most gorgeous cemeteries you've ever seen 
and like these incredible museums and like the best ones are all about like the locals making these to celebrate Americans freeing them in World War II. <laughs> so, it's, <laughs> and it's like, okay, we did earn that, but it's just kind of weird to be in a country that's much better than yours. And they're just like, Americans, oh, thank you guys so much for saving us. Like, <laughs> like we were walking through Bastogne and we like turned the corner and there's like this big mural of like the American flag and like the 101st airborne emblem and everything. And it was just like, yeah, I guess we did kind of liberate them from Nazis. So, yeah. <laughs> so they probably do love us. Um, but that's yeah, funny though. Yeah. And then just, just, I, I think the other thing I realized was we went to a bunch of museums and cemeteries and some of the locations. And I think what I realized is museums are cool. Nothing against museums, but like there's a tier in my head of like worst to best historical experiences and like, like reading something is, is, is okay. Like somebody's yep. firsthand experience of it is a little bit better. Seeing artifacts from the period, like, oh, that's a real like MG42 or oh, that's a real helmet from the era. That's better. But what really kept striking me was seeing like the actual locations kept very similar to how they were when it happened. Um, and so I, th I think the first time I realized that was um, we went to Verdun and uh we were kind of just driving around because verdun is actually i mean verdun's a verdun's a city but it turns out that there was like seven forts and the battle at verdun was like a year long so basically it's just like mm -hmm. a huge area and so we were just driving to the museum and um what we found out later was that all the like the no man's land all the bombed out parts like they pulled the bodies out and they pulled the artifacts out as best they could over a couple of years and then they were like well, nobody should really live here anymore because it's pretty fucking dangerous. There's like unexploded yeah. shells everywhere. So we're just yeah. going to like like plant a forest over all of it. And so you, you're driving through Verdun. You're just kind of like, OK, it looks like a forest. And at this point, the trees are like 100 years old. So you're like, OK, it looks like a pretty a pretty well established forest, you know, and you're like, I guess mm. it was over here. I guess it was over here. And then I look over to my right and there's a clearing and the clearing is probably like four or five acres. And there's just all these fucking shell craters <laughs> like there's just holes in the ground and there's rubble in them and there's a couple plaques and there's a little chapel in the middle of it. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? So I pull over and we get out and we start reading this plaque and the plaque is like, this was the village of Flurry. Like 400 people lived here. This village was here for hundreds of years. And in World War One, over the course of the fighting, completely fucking gone like the entire village and you realize you start walking around and every crater is a building that's been destroyed and those are the original craters that are there and they start to have these plaques that you're walking around and they're like this is where the tailor lived this is where the butcher lived and like the only thing they rebuilt was the chapel and then where the streets were they they did paths either either um like gravel or um like concrete paths and mm. so we're walking around it and we're just like this is fucked man like like the whole landscape was like this and this little village that was a place is just no more because it just got completely decimated, decimated. yeah, yeah. and then in the museum we later found an image and it showed that town as it was by the end of the war and literally complete no man's land absolutely nothing there except for the craters and rubble and like a single tree that was like dead and had no leaves on it and now it's like surrounded by a forest and it has all this grass yeah. through it so like seeing that and then going to see um, Band of Brothers in Bastogne, that, that mm. TV series, their original foxholes are still there, the ones they dug. They're in a section wow. of the forest that they, they put a gate around so people can't mess with it, but you can go in there and like get in their foxholes and some of the World War I trenches are still there. So like being able to like see these actual spots and be like, this is where they were. This is where a machine gun emplacement was and it was facing that field is like, is crazy man yeah it's... there's there's definitely a m much more visceral element to seeing something in person and like i've listened to um like hardcore history with dan carlin and yeah. he paints a very a very brutal picture of stuff like that yeah. and i know specifically one episode he did on verdun um you know it's like harrowing like it, it's just it, it's it's crazy but actually going there and seeing it hits so much more and, and so much differently um i know j just from just from doing that in the U S like going to Gettysburg or going to, yeah. um, 
you know some of some of the more uh the 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 stuff in like Williamstown and and uh the more historical stuff you don't get so much from just reading like you said or 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 watching a movie or something like that like actually being there changes your perspective a little bit so yeah i mean i would love to do something like that i i used to be a really big history buff and now i kind of just listen to podcasts and stuff but that's fine I don't know, it's, it's awesome yeah yeah so so just to round out the trip to europe like just an incredible place uh it turns out it's a fantastic time to go to europe right now because the euro is basically the same as the dollar so everything's on sale <laughs> everything's on sale and there's no conversion it's just like that's the price i pay it's fantastic also like like i've talked about this before but there's a website called scott's cheap flights that i follow yes. um and then, and actually, I think I have the premium subscription, which is like 60 bucks a year because literally they just send you deals all day long for flights from your airports. So we flew, we flew from Orlando to Paris and back and each round trip ticket was $540, which is That's not, awesome. e it's not even the cheapest price we've seen before. It's just that we had to pick that price because of the dates were set. Um, yeah. so like it's. Like, I think we ended up going there. I think I was there for eight days. I think total, it's probably 1500 bucks per person. Like, it's just, it's Not dirt bad. cheap to go to Europe. And it's just a fantastic place. Um, yeah. what, one more thing about the, about the history. The other thing that we kept coming across and that really got me going, that just got me, like, really excited. Well, actually, two things. One was we kept seeing dragon's teeth on the Siegfried line. So Siegfried line is the line between Germany and, um, and France. Basically, the, they called it the West Wall. Um, and so dragon's teeth are those concrete, like three or four foot tall barriers that they built on the West wall that keep tanks out. And so they built them all along the West and some of them have been paved over. Some of them have been removed. Some of them are in like farmer's fields, but we would find them in the forest or you'd be driving along and you drive into Germany and you look out and there'd be like a section of like 40 feet of the teeth, like in the middle of some farmer's field. And it's just like fantastic, like to be able to see that. Um, and then the other place we went that I wasn't expecting much, but was like very blew me away. And I want to be clear, blew me away in a bad way in a, oh, no. I am happy. I visited. I am not happy. It existed. I need to preface this. It's no longer functioning, but we did go to a Nazi training camp called Vogelsong, uh, which is basically we went through the museum and basically what happened was when Hitler took power in 33 slash 34, uh, he quickly took control of the education system and said, I'm going to create like three pseudo colleges around the country. And they are going to be where like men in their mid twenties go there to become like Ubermensch to become like, mm -hmm. you're going to be indoctrinated. You're going to be the best of men. And they had like a whole training program. So we basically built this like giant, like almost like a college campus in the in the middle of uh the eiffel uh forest in the northwest of germany but it's crazy because you're walking around you're like you're like looking at like how they've designed these buildings and this campus and like this outdoor theaters and like the summer solstice there's like this it's like a bunch of like literally buff men with their dicks out because it's just like this is what it means to be a man you know uh and then they're just and it's like all sorts of stuff like that and they're like this is the common dining hall and you're like like all the buildings still exist um mm. and you're like this is pretty crazy and then you go to the museum and it's like here's a picture of hitler when he visited here's goebbels in that classroom you were just in and you're just like this is crazy and then they have pictures of the original statues and inscriptions which is good because when you go see like uh they had like this big like 20 by 10 foot like marble wall with a statue on it and some mm -hmm. of the words are removed so in there's like some carvings and there's like sections of the stone that have been replaced and you're like i wonder what it said there and then you go to the museum and it's just like insert it's like i will serve my fuhrer adolf hitler and you're like oh okay all right i see now i see why they removed that makes that. sense yeah and then like <laughs> like the statues have bullet holes in them because when the americans took over they were just like fuck just you shot them. <laughs> just yeah. shot them up but it was just crazy just another experience of like I've heard about it. I've read about it. I watched it, but to actually be in like this crazy, insane, huge complex Fogel song that was built by the Nazis to like train their Ubermensch. It's just like, Oh, history's real. Oh, huh. Oh huh. yeah. Yeah. Anyways, Europe is fantastic. Y'all should, uh, y'all should go to Europe. Uh, you know what else you should do is listen to the news. It's the short theme. I didn't change it out. Where 
here talking about news. It's gaming news. What's up, news? Oh, thanks as always, Zach. It's crazy. He's here every single week to just he hop is so on and dedicated. play. It. He's great. So dedicated. Thanks for the news and uh, for the news theme, and also thanks for rating us with a whole bunch of people that came in the middle of my very serious conversation about Nazis. <laughs> and uh, not a lot of context there, but uh, go to Europe. That's all you need to know. Let's talk about the news. Um, Kyle, tell me about Assassin's Creed Mirage. Oh boy, I would love to. And you know what? I've got just the person to fill us in on all the juicy details. The man, the myth, the legend, Jason Schreier, via a YouTuber named Jonathan. Jonathan spelled with an O, or a, a zero instead of an O. So this new Assassin's Creed, supposedly, uh, well, actually confirmed now by yes. Ubisoft, thanks to the league, yes. uh, is called Assassin's Creed <laughs> Mirage. And it is supposedly a return to form uh more stealth focused it's going to take place uh in baghdad from 860 to 870 during the anarchy in samara uh you will play as basim or basim uh in his youth as a thief until he arrived at the hidden ones i don't know oh, what any of this that's, stuff that's means some some assassin's creed bullshit that's yeah, what that is yeah, yeah yeah but the the big thing that i'm really interested in is as you know, I've logged like 140 some hours or 30 some hours into Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is extremely different from the original Assassin's Creed games. So this new game, Mirage, supposedly is going to be a return to basics with several RPG elements completely removed. So there's no more dialogue choices, choices, no more gender choices, and no more level system. Thank God, because I hate the, the level gating that they do with certain locations. I really yeah. just... If I'm an assassin, I want to go up and be able to stab anyone in the game. Like, that's that's what made the first game so much fun. Um, yes, I'm looking at chat, too. More like at money sign, money sign, at, uh, at assassin. Yeah. yeah great, so anyways, this, I I, uh, I don't know how to feel about this because I it felt like I played Origins and I felt like that was heading in the right direction. It definitely had some stuff that wasn't great in it, like you mentioned, the level you gating and stuff. But you liked that more than more than Odyssey, right? Or more I, than I never uh, played, Valhalla? I never played Odyssey and I didn't play Valhalla. Origins okay. was just like an itch that I wanted to scratch and then I ended up playing it for like 25, 30 hours because it was just good enough for me to keep going. Mm. And so with this one, I feel like there are good things in New Assassin's Creed. Like I actually do kind of like, a, I don't want to say the gear system, but a, like I do think there needs to be a little bit of like a level up in a way. Maybe it's yeah. through skills. Um, I do really like the, the the drone bird eagle stuff, and apparently this will also be coming back in this new one. But Good. I don't want it going fully back to the old way, which feels like more of just a very stripped down linear type of video game in an open world space, and it didn't really push me mechanically. So I just I don't know how this is going to go. I feel like Assassin's Creed is it really in a like one out of three is great mode right now between origins odyssey and valhalla so it's like this also seems like a boring setting they've kind of already done this you know so. yeah i'm i'm interested to see i mean based on just the the little teaser image that they put out it looks just visually extremely similar to the original um which took place in uh d during the um the the crusades um so you know, there was there were some cities like there, like Jerusalem or Acre, where it they did a pretty good job of doing like the historical stuff back in the the first one. But as the games progressed, they got way more like, hey, this thing is exactly this thing from history. So I hope they continue that trend because I do like that part. But yeah, I'm kind of on the same lines of like, I don't know if I don't know if Baghdad is going to be visually interesting compared to like venice or yeah. um or or egypt itself with like you have these iconic sort of um world renowned uh images that you get to climb up and it's like well what's in baghdad and i'm sure there's stuff in there that it's like oh i had no idea that baghdad could look this beautiful or or had this much interesting stuff but like is that going to be enough of a, a tease for people to want to play a game that's in that setting um yeah there's there's a couple other things uh that this person that uh jason schreier is going off of apparently secretly ubisoft is preparing a remake of assassin's creed one based on uh mirages like look so i'm guessing the 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 systems that they're using for that 
they're going to reuse a bunch of assets from that game. It makes sense if it's just a remake. They kind of want to take the take the easiest, quickest path. It should be integrated into a season pass, which will also include a DLC of Constantinople, um, which could be really cool. I, I do like Constantinople as a as a potential location to explore, um, and it might be released a few months after the game releases. So I think there's. Like you said, there's potential for sure. Um, I just, I want to see more. And it sounds like they're not quite ready to show more yet. So I think we're just going to have to wait and see. No, I think, didn't they say September 10th? Oh, did they? I might have missed that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, when, okay. when they, when they came out and they basically said, yeah, it's, it's real. Like they already had an Assassin's Creed planned, uh, oh, okay. an Assassin's Creed direct an assassin oh, the ubisoft forward okay. yes uh, right. an assassin's creed screed on september 10th and then they they already had that planned and announced and then they released the image in the title today of assassin's creed mirage so um i i i think i think we're both a little bit more pessimistic than optimistic but we'll see how it goes you know yeah i don't know man ubisoft just you keeps know, making bad games lately <laughs> you know who else has made a not good game uh 343 industries i halo yeah infinite. this next story is basically halo infinite came out with their uh plan for upcoming uh their roadmap their fall and winter roadmap and at the end of it they said quote however there's bad news for fans of couch co-op the local split screen co-op boat has now been canceled it's a blow to those who have been waiting since launch for the old school feature but it's seemingly a matter of priorities uh, an, an inside quote. Oh yeah, sorry, that was not a quote, that was IGN. Here's the quote from uh, 343. In order to improve and accelerate ongoing live service development and to better address player feedback and quality of life updates, we have reallocated studio resources and are lo no longer working on local campaign split screen co-op, said 343 Industries, according to IGN. That's some bullshit, folks. Uh, we were talking a little bit about this in the uh, Subpixel Discord, y'all should join. But basically... It feels like from the very beginning, this this project has been severely under resourced. They had the two or three like reworks and rewrites. They had to delay it basically an entire year, and it also came out a little bit bare bones. And uh, they've also now basically canceled one of the most like requested features that was in closed beta out in the public, the local co op split screen. Which look, I'm just gonna say it doesn't seem that hard to implement there are plenty of fps games with local split screen co-op and halo has done it plenty of times before and so this just feels like they it feels like they had a vision of a game they never got to that vision they put out what they had and now they can't even do post-launch support uh, I, I don't know do you think i'm i'm off kilter with that no, infinite was the first mainline halo game i never finished and i have i've actually gone back to it three times in i don't know how many how many different months since its release and i still cannot it just doesn't it doesn't do anything for me yeah. it doesn't grab me Same. um and i i you know i i think that they've had so many issues just behind the scenes with people moving um things getting reset on the story or on the multiplayer front and it seems like they really prioritize the multiplayer and the single player stuff really got put on the back burner uh which is unfortunate because halo is known for its single players or it, it used to be known for its single player experiences um so split screen not being in a mainline halo game is really unfortunate even though i know when they when they announced halo was uh or infinite was was going to have it they were like yeah there's like a lot of weird things with the way that we've done uh you know actually built the game that make it weird and that always felt like an excuse to me because I I really I mean if you can do Forge, which of course is still is Forge even ready? Is it is it, I, are they still I working on it? Don't believe so. Let me let me check this roadmap real quick. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe they really just screwed up uh, big time. I mean I think it's clear that they did on some front. But like if they can't even do Forge, oh, then I'm sorry. Guess... Forge beta is planned for sometime between November eighth and March seventh wonderful yeah so that i think i i don't mean to go back to my point but i really do think it's that they just they are not giving this game its due resources because you mentioned um focusing on multiplayer versus single player which i do think is true but there was also plenty of complaints that that game came in with fantastic multiplayer for free and then just had like nothing done to it 
for like months yeah. and months and months. So they, I think, I think they are capable of putting out good content, but they have spread themselves so thin with what limited resources they have. And again, these are assumptions, but it feels like they are just doing, oh, uh, we're going to do a little bit of this and then a little bit of that and then a little bit of that. And they're not committing to single features or areas and fully delivering on that. The single player campaign yeah. is basically like it doesn't even feel fully complete. Like I didn't finish it either, but it's apparently pretty short, a lot of similar stuff, and then it just kind of ends. So like, yeah, this just feels like. And I think the problem is there's a core game in here that is fantastic. Like, I think the core, core gameplay of Halo Infinite feels great. It feels like a Halo game, and they have some interesting ideas. It's just not well executed all the yeah. way throughout, which is a shame. Uh, totally agree. So I'd care not to talk about it anymore. That's fine. Let's talk about PlayStation. They are buying a mobile studio, and they have created a mobile division. Uh, PlayStation has now acquired, or they have announced plans to buy Savage Game Studios. It's a mobile game studio based in Finland and Germany. They work on AAA live service games. Um, they did not disclose the sale price due to contractual commitments, um, but they did say that this is part of the company's effort to expand PlayStation to, quote, additional platforms. So, folks, let's just say it. there are going to be some PlayStation mobile games either based on existing or new IPs. What do you think about this, Kyle? Is this a good idea, dumb idea? What would you like to see? What are we probably going to see? I, I am the wrong person to ask about this because I do not care about mobile games. Um, I have I, the, the amount of That's mobile fair. games that I have played in my life is, is minuscule. I think I have a few saved on my phone just for when I'm in like an airport. Or I'm, I'm just going to say this. It's pr that number is probably very close to the number of good mobile games because yeah, as somebody who frequently occasionally dives into mobile games like i i just dived into some mobile games a week or two ago because i one of my favorite things to do on a plane is listen to a podcast while i'm playing a mobile game mm -hmm. and it's still just a lot of trash like like for example i was looking for a good sudoku sudoku game and or a good pick cross game and you you can't go to the store and search that because it's going to be full of ads and you can't tell from the reviews because the reviews are curated what's actually good or not. So then you go to Google and you type in like best pick cross Android game and every list is going to be full of like some bullshit in it. Well, first you got to find a good website that's reputable <laughs> and then it's going to have some bullshit in its list and then you've got to click through and half of them aren't on the store anymore and you can't search for them because there's not like a title exclusivity in, in the Apple or Google Play store. So you're just going to find 15,000 clones instead of the one you're trying to look for. So like the entire ecosystem is just fucked. So long story short, I don't blame you for not playing that many mobile games. <laughs> what okay what is this studio made do we know like what games they've they've worked on or or have experience with based on this article all they said is is this is from GameSpot. it is currently working on a triple a live service game for mobile okay so that i guess they just don't have like a they have a pedigree but we don't know like what it is um i i guess what they're doing is working if sony wanted to buy them out or at least sony thinks yeah. that they can they can turn something around but yeah i i just checked i have seven games on my phone and i have not added a single game in like five years probably i have uh alto's adventure which is just like a pretty game everybody knows that one and plague inc i, I used to play plague inc like all the time because mm -hmm. it was just it was fun and then some like random like dot uh game and and that's, that's yeah. about it like yeah it's just not I'm not I, interested in that space. Like, I want to be clear, like, like mobile games can be fantastic. Um, and I've played some fantastic ones, but the problem is that there are too many games that are either non mobile games that are just ported to mobile. And it's like, no, this is a different format. Like, you know, we talked about Diablo infinite earlier this year and basically how, um, like it's, it's not great for mobile because it's very resource heavy. You can't really pick it up and put it down. It's not a five minute crapper type of game. Um, and then there are the types of games that are just like exploitative. They're clones of something else or they're just built around ads and they're just built to be addictive like Candy Crush and they're just disruptive. So there are absolutely good ways to make good mobile games. Yeah. Um, this this does not look like this. I, I hate to be pessimistic. And honestly, this is less about Sony and PlayStation and more just about the space of mobile games. But I think this is them 
trying to cash in like Nintendo did with that stupid fucking Mario Kart tour, the Mario Runner game, where they're just yeah. like, let's take whatever popular trend there is now that makes a lot of money for people and just slap an IP on it. And I, I yeah, I'm pretty, pretty pessimistic about this. Sucks. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I, if something special happens and they, you know, they knock it out of the park. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll finally try a new mobile game. But as it stands right now, don't really care. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, more pessimism. There's a new Mafia oh game in development at Hangar 13. It's been announced. They said, quote, I'm happy to confirm that we've started working on an all new Mafia project while it's a few years away and we can't share anything more right now. We're really excited to keep working on this beloved franchise and entertain our players with new stories. Uh, Kyle, what's your what's your history with the Mafia series? I have played the first two Mafia games, and I actually really like the second one, yeah. mainly because the demo on Steam gave you a mini open world to play around in, and it was great, because it was like the poor man's GTA. Um, I remember being, I think I was like 14 or 15, and I would just, I would just replay that same demo over and over. And then when I finally got the game, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually like a pretty fun game. It's it's decent. Yep. You know, it, it runs okay. It was, it, was, it was good. I liked it. Um, stepped away from the series, and then when Mafia 3 came out to extremely middling reviews, I was like, mm, I don't think I'm going to play it. So hearing that there's a new one, uh, I, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm still kind of waiting. Yeah, and, and the problem is Mafia 3 was made by Hangar 13. These are the same people that did Mafia yeah. 3. And, and like, Mafia 3 was, was like, Mafia 3 was weird to me because... It it was not an Italian story. It was it mm. was it was about African American, right? Yeah, it was New Orleans African American. He, but he's he's mob adjacent. But you're not playing like an Italian wise guy. And it was like cool. And honestly, I was really enjoying the story. And I played about an hour mm. and a half of it. But it had a lot of bugs, and the gameplay didn't. The shooting didn't feel good, and the gameplay like, um, it there were like two mission types and it got to this point where it's like, do these two mission types over and over again until you have enough reputation or something. And oh, like, so like just grinding. Yeah. Um, that that kind of grind where there's not enough variety in it. And so I, I was out at that point. Um, yeah. Which was a shame because the story looked really cool. And, and just like you, like I, I played mafia one and I really enjoyed it. Like, it's just a cool little, like, like I remember the thing that blew my mind was like, they have working traffic lights yeah. And, and if you go past the cops going too fast or, or they spot you, you'll get a ticket and they'll come yeah. after you for that. Like, so it felt like a slightly like more realistic adult uh, Grand Theft Auto and the Mafia 2 liked the story. Pretty cool story. Pretty good open world game. Um, and like you mentioned, it looked fantastic for the time. Yeah. Um, so Mafia 3, like we said, disappointment. And to see the people who did Mafia 3 and I don't know that they ever really acknowledged their crimes. They, they, I don't think they ever atoned for their sins. I, I could be wrong on this, but it felt like they put out Mafia 3 and it came out to very middling reviews. And they, I don't want to say they said F you, but they were just like, well, you can't win them all. And then I, like, at least, like, we've talked about No Man's Sky before and how I'm still not happy with that game, but at least they, they recognized their sin and tried to make do in a way and make things yeah. better. But to give Hangar 13 another shot at a Mafia game after they pretty much screwed the pooch on three. Did it like make money? Like, did it did it do it probably, really well in I, sales? I don't think it did really well, but it definitely had a lot of ad budget behind it. So it did make some money, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. I yeah. don't know if I would have given it to him, but maybe, you know, maybe they, they've they've ridden that high of mediocrity for long enough. And they're like, let's make something really great. So whatever I, mafia yeah. four ends up being i i it's just such a shame because really i i should be very excited about a mafia four but as soon as i saw hangar 13 i was like yeah nah mm. nah not really i hear you uh let's talk about some good news do you remember rocksmith plus i remember rocksmith what was rocksmith plus so rocksmith plus uh was announced last e3 i believe or maybe the e3 before that it's the new version of rocksmith it's a cloud service but um you use your real guitar similar to the original rocksmith and it teaches you how to play a guitar using like a guitar hero similar interface so it's basically just like super gamified uh guitar teaching 
um, and they're basically launching a brand new updated service. Uh, it says it's 15 bucks a month, 40 for three months or a hundred for a year. You can use your phone to listen to your guitar and judge you on that. Or you can use, there's like a, um, it's a, a quarter plug to USB cable, which sounds insane, but it has a chip in it. So it works. So you can turn your, your plug-in guitar into like a MIDI instrument, basically. <laughs> well, not, awesome. not quite a MIDI instrument, but enough so that your rocksmith can be like, Oh yeah, we can tell exactly what notes you're playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're finally launching it. I, I just, I wanted to bring this up because this is such a cool interface between education and gaming that yeah. part of me wants to actually buy an electric guitar and learn how to play it with this. I don't know. Yeah. How, how about you? Like, is any, any of this appealing to you? Yeah, I remember when, um, when Rocksmith first was announced, I was like, that would get me to buy a guitar and, and try and learn guitar. But the fact that this is much more, um, I guess, user-friendly, uh, but also like teaching focused or, or training focused, yep. that that appeals to me quite a bit. And that would be really, really fun. My question is, can you use like an acoustic electric guitar? Like yes. Is it, I guess it just doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, because it doesn't, it doesn't even, you can use a full acoustic guitar because they, they have a companion app. So you have on your phone. So you use your phone as the microphone if you don't have one hooked up to your PC. And that's how it tells if you're playing the notes properly or not. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that sounds great. And it sounds, I'm glad that they're releasing it, uh, or, or like finally releasing it after, I guess, how long has it been since they announced it? But that, it sounds great. I, I hope it does well. And if uh, if people want us to, I would love to play it on stream with my terrible, uh, non-existent guitar lessoned fingers ready to go. Yeah, I've tried to play guitar a couple times, and um, it's a terrible fucking instrument to play. It's just <laughs> like like playing a piano. Piano is very easy to play. Like to at least get started to play. <laughs> And then yeah. there's there's like slightly more like I've also played the tuba for a year in middle school, which like you got to do some stuff with your mouth and your lungs a little bit, but it's, you can still play it, you know, and the trumpet's a little bit harder and like the violin, it, you got to learn the technique of it, but you can make some noise like fucking guitar, man. It's just like fucking like finger tortured callous city and you're just like this is awful and then the whole thing of like you're not supposed to look at the six strings but you're supposed to like p be able to pick all of them at will is just like yeah like spatial awareness of your fingertips is just insane so i i have played an electric guitar a couple times and it's like a boner machine like it's it feels fantastic so there is part of me that looked up a uh, good budget beginner electric guitars and electric amps the other day just to see if I really needed to do this. I don't know. I don't know. That could be a cool stream series, but it could also be terrible. And I could regret my decision about two weeks in when I, I feel like that could be, that could be like an extra life challenge or something like that, where you have to play like one song. I think that could be pretty fun. Yeah. Although I was just thinking even going further than that is like, if we reach a threshold, then somebody has to learn how to play the guitar and they for a year <laughs> like they sign up for yeah. rockman for a year yeah, yeah. and they oh, stream man. their practice sessions every every week yeah that's i i think that's a good that's a good challenge uh all right let's talk about another big challenge another big boy warner brothers has trademarked big chungus for use in a video game uh kyle how that we are an audio podcast how would you describe big chungus big chungus is everything you didn't know you wanted about bugs bunny um put into bugs bunny which is basically just the the body and and weight of like a 60 year old white guy yeah you know, like it's 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 he's just bigger there's more to love and uh he's just big chungus you know i mean why wouldn't you want him in a video game it's bugs bunny plus like <laughs> two oh, excuse me, two three hundred pounds um yeah it's just kind of weird because i'm pretty sure it's warner brothers so the assumption here is that big chungus is coming to multiverse is probably as a skin for bugs bunny um it's just very weird because the trademark it's like a trademark application. So it has all the data, it has a number, and then it just says dash big chungus, and it's just like a sketch of big chungus. <laughs> it's just a little disturbing because I feel like big chungus is a meme. 
and I'm not, I don't like the idea of a corporation coming in and taking this internet created meme and just slapping a trademark on it. So, so I actually did some research on this Ooh, by accident. Um, it was an actual thing in a Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes uh, episode the before it was a meme. The name and not, everything? N not the name, but Bugs Bunny like yeah. morphs into an Elmer Fudd version of himself. Mm -hmm. And that's where like the somebody screen capped that and then added Big Chungus on like some forum. Um, it might have been Reddit and it, it blew up. So in Space Jam 2, he does make an appearance. Bug Bunny, again, is like talking with... Uh, lebron james and he he like puffs himself up into big chungus for like a couple seconds and then he's gone so there you know it is a valid history of warner brothers i guess but like the fact that it is morphed into this this meme and uh has has a storied past just on the internet is pretty pretty weird but also pretty funny so i i, I can't say i'm unexcited i mean i would love to play as big yeah. chungus i feel like a uh, a smash clone or a smash type game is the perfect place to have some fun with some of this yeah. stuff, whether it's a skin or just how the characters behave. Like I'm just imagining they added a Naruto character, like, like <laughs> he does the Naruto run everywhere. And then like a lot of his moves are Naruto run based, you know, like his dash is that, yeah. um, you could just have a lot of fun with stupid stuff like that. For sure. Uh, so folks, I think that's going to do it for this week of a local chat. I'm still a little tiny bit jet lagged, mostly just because I'm tired. So I'm going to go to bed. Kyle, I don't know what you're doing. You got any plans this evening? Um, I'm going to watch Game of Thrones or excuse me, House of the Dragon. Um, Get caught up a little bit. I watched the first episode, thought it was decent. I thought it was good. Um, So catch up on that and then maybe play some Fire Emblem and try and get get past the boring part. But I have a feeling as we talked about at the beginning of this episode, I'm going to be in for a bit of a rough ride with that game. So yeah. we'll see. Give it a shot and then go play Persona 5 or Awakening. Either way. All right. Uh, well, folks, that's going to do it for this. 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 E this evening. Sorry, folks. It's a little wonky around here. We like a little wonk. It's there okay. we go. It's a little better now. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm Ian Gibson. He's Kyle Bailey. You can find me at Thanks Gibson. You can find him at Kyle of the Beard. And you can find us at subpixelfilms.com where we have all sorts of content, including documentaries, uh, new episodes of Pixel 8, as well as all of our stream archives. Uh, you can also find us uh, at Subpixel Team on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. We've got all sorts of stuff coming up. Tomorrow is nothing, but I believe Saturday is the return of Poke Will Season 2. We're going to be playing some Pokemon White. Don't hold me to it. I, it's on the schedule, but the schedule may change. But stay tuned to our Twitter. We may be playing some more Pokemon. It's been such a great time. Thank you so much for joining us, Kyle. Happy to be here. See y'all. Bye. See you guys.